doing well, well. It is fantastic to be here, or yeah, as we say in the South, right? Uh, I think I might be in the wrong place. I was told that I was giving a speech in Chapel Hill. There can't possibly be this many conservatives in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Oh, my goodness. It is absolutely awesome to be with you guys. And I was taking a look at the title of the speech, and as I was preparing for it, I looked at it and I said, I can't believe I gave that title for a speech because now I've got to go and explain what cultural Marxism is. I mean, we have a title here that deals with how our university campuses sort of inculcate and spread cultural Marxism. And so now I've got to explain that term because when people think about Marxism, to be honest, they think about economic Marxism and they don't think about its cultural counterpart at all. And so I guess the best possible place for me to start this evening is to actually distinguish between the two. A lot of people know what economic Marxism is, and it's interesting. I have really gotten accustomed to explaining what economic Marxism is because so many people ask me the question, why is it that our college campuses are so full of Marxists? Peter Kraft, about 15 years ago, writing a fantastic book called How to Win the Culture War, uh, said that there are more communists teaching on American college campuses than there are living in the former Soviet Union. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that is such a good quote. I wish I would have said that, basically, because... It really is dead on, and so I actually do get the question all the time, why is it that our campuses are just full of Marxists? Well, if you actually want to be able to give a serious answer to that question, you really need to know something about what Marxism is. And as someone who has a Ph.D. in criminology from a sociology department, I had to take all of those courses where we studied Marx over and over again. And his whole theory of economics was really interesting. He thought that one capitalist consumes many. And what that meant was that you would have this small capitalist class, but because of the nature of competi competition in capitalism, that class would actually get smaller and smaller as time goes on. And the consequence of that is that that only other class that there is, which is the have-nots or the proletarian, that would actually get larger over time. And so his dream for seeing a Marxist revolution was that eventually – through increasing urbanization, people moving into cities, and through increasing technology that allowed people to communicate with one another to a greater degree, as that class of people who didn't have anything got bigger and bigger and closer and closer one to one another and talking to each other more often, that eventually that was going to result in a Marxist revolution, basically. And you think about it, what happens when there's a Marxist economic revolution? Well, the consequence is that it becomes an economic system where it is from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Well, what is that? It's Well, it's Barack Obama, basically. It's the idea. <laughs> It's the idea of income and wealth redistribution. And I want you to think about it. Who on earth would think that, that that's a good deal? I want to be average. I want to have exactly what everyone else has. I mean, you kind of want to you, – you almost have to have low self-esteem and be non-competitive and not very ambitious to think that being average is a net gain for you. That's why I always say that Marxism is for losers. I mean that literally. It benefits losers. What the heck does that have to do with Marxists on college campuses? It's, it's really simple. Have you ever thought about the tenure system? We have a tenure system on our college campuses that says basically, well, you know, this job doesn't pay very well at all. You can't get rich in the process of pursuing an academic career. But, you know, here's the good part of it. If you only work hard for five years, then you get tenure and you have a lifetime contract and you get complete job security. That's the appeal for the Marxist. I'm never going to be wealthy, but I'm so insecure. I don't want to compete out there. I don't think I can really do well. So I'm going to go in this enclave there this kind of separate society known as the university where I can be as obnoxious as I want and I can't possibly lose my job, but hey, you know what? I'll be average. I'll be able to pay the rent. And it really is just a mentality there, and it really is a system that draws the Marxists onto our college campus. 
And when we do think about Marxism, though I'm being very serious, we have a tendency to think about it in economic terms. But we don't really think about it enough in cultural terms. You know, the Marxist also believes that there is this close nexus uh, between uh, your social beliefs and your economic beliefs. And by the way, a lot of conservatives get this wrong. And th they'll say, oh, well, you know what, I am, I am people who call themselves conservative. They will say, oh, well, you know, I'm economically conservative. I'm fiscally conservative, but I'm not so conservative on social issues. As if you can divorce the two. If you are economically conservative and you're socially liberal, you're not a conservative. That means you're a libertarian. Okay? It really, it's, it's not the same thing. The conservative understands, of course, that if you want to have a government that is limited and a government that is small and low taxes – and to have a thriving economic system, what do you need to have? It's very important that you have strong families, and that's where the social issues come in. And see, see the Marxists have a tendency to get that. To get that, they understand that if we are going to have the state come in and control everything, there's a couple of things we need to get out of the way. We need to undermine the family as the foundation of our society. And one way that we do that, of course, is to do away with religion. And that's the reason why Marx talked all the time about religion. He said that religion is the opiate of the masses. And so there is that connection. And so if we look on our college campuses at these Marxists, we understand that they're not just working towards an economic goal. They're also working towards certain cultural goals as well. How do they achieve it? How are they going to radically transform our society? And I'll tell you something. I'm really bothered not just by the fact that Barack Obama got elected, but that he got elected twice in this country. Because we should have known when he said, I want to radically transform the society. People like Jimmy Carter in the past have said, well, we just want to we want to solve some problems. Right. They didn't actually say we want to radically transform the society. That's how we should have known from the beginning. Most people should have known and cared that he's a Marxist. And what have we seen happen to the culture over the course of the last eight years? It really actually has been radically transformed because he really has been using the bully pulpit to do what? To get a, a culturally Marxist agenda implemented throughout our society and fundamentally change by investing in our youth and changing their worldview in a very fundamental way. So this is an ambitious agenda that they have on our college campuses. So the question then is, how could you possibly succeed in doing that? That's where the free speech thing comes in. You can't possibly have radical cultural transformation on our college campuses unless you go out there and interfere with the marketplace of ideas. And their success in getting really bad ideas out there on the college campuses accepted has hinged upon their ability to interfere with freedom of expression and to undermine the First Amendment. And we can never be confused when we look at our college administrators and look at them and think, oh, stupid administrator, look at, the, look at this stupid idea that they've had. Look at this stupid thing that they've done. No, they're not stupid. They're not ignorant of the First Amendment. They are hostile towards the First Amendment because they have a radical agenda out there which involves pushing ideas that really can't survive in a free and open marketplace of ideas. And so the mechanism for eventually transforming the culture by immediately transforming the college campus, it really revolves around the issue of freedom of speech. And that's why this is a huge issue for us to focus on in terms of not just putting out some of the fires that we see in front of us right now and some of the embarrassing things that are happening with regard to free speech, but also really thinking for the long term about how we're going to invest in young people and sort of restore the foundation of this country. And so I really want to focus on three things that I think are enormous threats to free expression on campus that are really helping that agenda to succeed. And one of those things that I talked about last night on the campus of UNC Chapel Hill was the concept of the campus speech code. And for those of you who were there, uh, you noticed in that speech, I, I kind of morphed from a discussion of the campus speech code to the concept of microaggression. And so I actually want to put those two concepts together and talk about those for just a second. Uh, campus speech codes and microaggression, by the way, it is quite possible that there are some people in this room who really don't know exactly what I mean when I talk about a campus speech code. So I really need to just give an example. 
as I was saying in my speech last night, I, I didn't learn about campus speech codes until 1992. My last full year as a graduate student at uh, Mississippi State University. But boy, I learned in a big way the next year when I took my job at UNCW. And back then I was an atheist and I was a Democrat and I was certainly a radical. And you guys are trying to figure out which is worse, I noticed. <laughs> There's actually a little worse response there to the Democrat part. But seriously, I was hinging as a Democrat because, by the way, no kidding, I voted for Michael Dukakis in 1988. <laughs> no. Will you let me finish the whole free speech thing? Because it gets much worse. <laughs> I voted for Dukakis, complaining that he was too conservative. And we should actually have a socialist-leaning candidate who was running at that time. But actually, no, I, I got there as, uh, as a leftist and an atheist on the campus. And having heard about the, the speech codes, one of the first things I did was to actually open up our uh, university handbook, uh, faculty and student handbook, and I read the speech code that was on the books at that time, and it said that students, faculty, and staff had a right to be comfortable at all times and unoffended along the lines of, and then it just gives this long list of different demographic variables, you know, and it's along the lines of sexual orientation and along the lines of religion and race and gender and all of this stuff. And it was really fortunate timing that the exact moment when I read that speech code, the chair of my department, Stephen McNamee, who's kind of a, an old school liberal, and he's not a crazy leftist, he's kind of an old school, I would call him kind of a JFK uh, liberal, basically, and seriously, kind of mainstream liberal, like, boy, I wish we still had those on the campus. He's retired, by the way, but... Anyway, he was listening to me as I actually um, read the speech code, and I was just infuriated by it. I said, it's just preposterous. You can't possibly have a ban on offensive speech because everyone is potentially offended by something. You know, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said it best in his dissenting opinion in 1925 in Gitlow versus New York when he said, every idea is an incitement. Every idea potentially sets someone off. And that's a fantastic quote, e even though I have a different worldview. You know, I, I kind of that's one of those quotes where I gosh, I wish I said that because that is so especially applicable today. And so I said that to him and his response was so honest. He said, well, they're not talking about all ideas. They're just talking about some ideas. OK, so he's just saying it here at the university. Well, you know, they only try to use the speech code to suppress certain ideas. Well, I would certainly learn a lot more about that later. I converted to theism in 1996 in prison in South America. <laughs> I love to pause. I was visiting. I, I, I love to, I'm a criminologist, right? I love to give it like five seconds. People are like, who did he kill? Okay. <laughs> But then I uh, actually joined the NRA and the Republican Party in 1999. <clears throat> and then in 2000, I converted to Christianity uh, after I got off of death row in Texas. <laughs> the pause didn't work that time. I was actually visiting someone on death row. True story. And I actually became involved in the campus free speech wars. Uh, I talked about an incident that I got involved in that where I was actually introduced to the fire. And I, man, I just started writing columns about this stuff. And I just got so lucky. And, and for some reason, Rush Limbaugh took an interest in some of my work. And people like Hannity and Bill O'Reilly had me on national TV a couple of times just to talk about some of my columns. And then I got the platform at townhall.com, and I met a guy by the name of David French, an attorney for the Alliance Defending Freedom, who now writes for the National Review. And he gave me a phone call in January of 2006 that was just one of those transformative moments. You know how you get a few phone calls in your life, you know, that are transformative moments. You know, someone has cancer, or someone's passed away, or sometimes they're positive, you know, and we all look back on our lives, and there are just a few calls where you got off the phone and your life just changed immediately. Well, I had one of those phone calls from David French where he said, listen, I'm leaving the fire and I'm going to work for the ADF. That's when he first started working for him. He said, because I want to get away from talking about this stuff and doing press releases to actually litigating cases. And he goes, I know that you speak on college campuses all across America. And what I need you to do is just go find really bad policies and really good plaintiffs. And we just need to get some lawsuits moving. And fortunately, I had met a young guy, 19 years old, by the name of A.J. Four. 
and he was a uh, student at Pennsylvania State University, and we had met at a Young America's uh, uh, Foundation, one of those, uh, I don't know where the get-together was. We had we met at some event, some sort of a retreat. I think it actually, actually might have been in Charlotte. And we had talked about their ridiculous speech code that they had on the campus, and it was extreme. I can't even remember all the things. There was so much absurdity packed into one paragraph that it's hard to recite. But it said basically you had a right at Penn State to be free from belittling language and offensive speech and that which makes you feel uncomfortable. And I think there was even a phrase in there about misdirected laughter. Don't – I'm not kidding. There, some speech codes contain a clause that, that says you can be prosecuted for misdirected laughter. Like if you tell me a joke and I laugh so hard I turn my head and I look at you and you think that I'm laughing at you when I'm not and you become offended – that can be prosecuted under the speech code, okay? It takes a PhD to think of something that's stupid. I mean, it's just, you have to be really overeducated and really bored to come up with something like that. But ultimately, they had a policy like that, and I found this young kid to agree to get involved in a lawsuit. And so he agreed to, to be the plaintiff in the case to file what is known as a facial challenge, which is to say that a, a, a speech code is just facially on its face. It's so bad that it chills free speech, and you don't actually have to prosecute anyone formally for it to be a violation of the law. And so I went to actually give a speech there uh, about six weeks after we had recruited him as a plaintiff. I was up at Penn State, and after my speech was over, A.J. came walking up to me at the reception, and he says, I want to show you a pamphlet that's being published with our, our mandatory student activities fees, and it's published by the English department, and it's just a combination of prose and poetry that's written by students and graduate students. And I opened this thing, and it's the worst poetry I have ever read in my life. I mean, it's like there, there's far better quality stuff written on the walls of bars on Franklin Street than this stuff. And I, I am reading this, and there's this one. I couldn't figure out if it was a poem or if it was prose. It was so awful. But it said Mother Teresa's blank, and it was a word beginning with C. It was a vulgar anti-Catholic screed that was written about Mother Teresa. And so I sat there, and, and A.J.'s Catholic, so he handed it to me, and he says, I just want you to read this. And I'm like, you need to give me some Alka-Seltzer or something. It was almost impossible for me to get through the thing. It was about a young kid who was raised Catholic, and he hated being Catholic. But he said, well, you know, one thing I liked about being Catholic was, you know, I used to have sexual fantasies about Mother Teresa. And he starts to write in all of this incredibly lewd graphic language. And then he goes on and talks about how he was sexually molested by the priest and so on and so forth. And the thing was just the most anti-Catholic filth I think I have ever read in my life. I'm not Catholic, but I'll tell you something. I looked at that, and I have many Catholic friends in the pro-life movement, and I said, I'm just sorry that they have to fund that through a mandatory stu uh, student fee. I said, why are you showing this to me? He goes, well, I'm just curious as to why they didn't get prosecuted under the speech code, but when I tried to have a table on campus in opposition to same-sex marriage last semester, they said that that would be potentially offensive. I said, AJ, you didn't tell me. They have actually applied the speech code to you. But that's incredible, isn't it? You know, think about that selective en enforcement of the speech code, and it really gives us an opportunity to pause and reflect and understand what they're up to. You see, Steve McNamee said, you can't possibly police all of that offensive speech, but you could if they only go after certain types of speech. So what the cultural Marxist wants to do is to use it to, to go after religion and then turn around and say that pro-religious speech is in fact more offensive than anti-religious speech. You see the game that they're involved in. That's what Marx was talking about. He talked about religion being the opiate of the masses and we need to get it out of the way. And we clearly see a profound religious bias in the application of the speech codes on our college campuses. What's interesting is that this problem, actually, as you look around and you see all these big cases happening out there, for many of you, you have a temptation to think, oh, this is the worst that it's ever been on our college campuses. Actually, that's not completely true. We actually have seen some improvement on the issue of campus speech codes. Uh, way back in 2004, 
I was asked to give a speech on Capitol Hill as a part of a panel with two other guys, and one of them was this young kid who was 20 years old who had just graduated at the age of 20 from UCLA, and he had been admitted to Harvard Law School, and he'd written a book about his experiences at UCLA. That was the day I met Ben Shapiro when we were together on that panel, and he got up, and my brain hurts when he talks because this guy, you know he's from Massachusetts because, I mean, they drive fast up there and they talk very fast. And he had this thick pile of papers there. And I remember him saying that he believed at that time that about 90% of our college campuses had patently unconstitutional speech codes. I think that was probably true. But we didn't really get an answer to how bad it was until 2005 when the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education actually started to do a survey. They actually started to assess and sample uh, handbooks all across the country, and we found out even though some lawsuits were beginning to get rid of some of those policies, we found out that clearly the vast majority of our campuses had these unconstitutional speech policies. I am thankful that because of a lot of lawsuits filed by the ADF and because of the persistent work in the court of public opinion by the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, that that number has actually now been reduced to about 45%. We're moving in the right direction. And campus administrators are realizing we can't have such broad speech codes out there on the books and, and actually have stupid administrators coming along and actually enforcing them. We've actually got to start to get rid of these. And they have. And so that actually, if there is some good news on our college campuses, it is that we have seen a reduction in the actual number of speech codes. But of course, whenever I start talking about something good, you know something bad is coming. The universities have realized that they can't go and suppress speech all the time through these campus speech codes because they're risking litigation. So they've started to come up with more creative ways of doing this, of trying to selectively enforce this idea of a constitutional right to be, unoff uh, to, uh, to be unoffended at all times. And you've heard of this before. It's this concept of the microaggression. This is a concept that is spreading across our college campuses just like wildfire. And over the course of just the last few years, the really dangerous development that we've seen is that in our student orientations on college campuses, the very first day that the kid gets there on the campus, they're actually taught about the concept of microaggression. And they're taught, you know, how they've been microaggressed, even if they don't know it, and how they need to learn how to detect microaggressions so that they can stop them. And it's interesting because they actually do this at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and we're going to do something about it. But they've been doing it for a couple of years down at UNC Wilmington. And I found out about it through a just a ridiculous case that occurred back in August with a, a student who had started at UNC Wilmington back in August. Her name is Rachel Bird, and her father, a longtime reader of my columns, found out that she was going to major in criminology. And he's like, oh, you got to go to UNC Wilmington because Mike Adams is there, and it means you get at least one conservative professor there. <laughs> I mean, he figured it was like, I'm the only one in the state, so send your daughter there, you know. So it's kind of funny. She actually introduced herself uh, the first week of class, and I had a talk with her, and I said, if you have any trouble at UNC Wilmington, you know who to talk to. Just just come see me. And she said, well, you know, actually there was something weird that occurred during the orientation, and it was so strange that I'd really like to talk to you about it. And I said, well, what was it? And she began to tell me about how they'd shown this film called What Kind of Asian Are You? And it was about questions that are inappropriate and how you might not have considered them to be offensive in the past, but how they're really offensive and why, and why you should be offended. They should have just called it why you should be offended by all kinds of new things that were never meant to be offensive at all. That should have actually been the title of the DVD that they played. But they showed that film to them explaining what a microaggression is, and then they had them break up in focus groups. You always know you're in trouble when there's a focus group. You're about to lose focus. I mean, there's no doubt about it. So they get them together to actually write about experiences where they had been microaggressed in their life. And there's, you know, poor little Rachel Bird there. She's like 5'2". And 
You know, if someone throws her in a pool and she's soaking wet, she'll hit 100 pounds, basically. You know, she's just this very petite girl. And I'll tell you how that's relevant in just a second. She writes down this comment that one time someone had said to her, had, had called her a stupid blonde chick. She's, you know, kind of a tough girl. And she's like, oh, that's the only time I can ever remember really being offended by something. She didn't realize that they were going to make everyone go around in the circle and stand up and read the instance of microaggression. So she stands up and she reads it, and this brilliant administrator, by the way, sarcasm is my love language, okay? (laughs) This brilliant administrator stands up and says, oh my goodness, someone called you a stupid blonde chick. I am so sorry that someone assumed your gender. You didn't tell them that you were female. And she's like, no, stupid. I was, I was offended because someone called me stupid. Not because someone called me a chick, because I obviously am. As a matter of fact, the fact that you think that's a close call. That's offensive. I know which bathroom to go in. How about you? No, she's thinking all of this stuff, man. Oh, she came and told me about that. And, you know, I celebrate these things because I'm like, it's time for another column. You know, and, (laughs) man, I've bought so many guns based on their stupidity. I mean, it's like, that's where my excess spending money comes from. But, no, seriously, I thought it was really outrageous when I got to thinking about it because you can see what they're doing. They're really trying to change the culture. And this is what cultural Marxism is all about. What we're trying to do is we're trying to expand the number of victim categories. You see how that fits in with the Marxist theme. And it's like many years ago, no one had sexual orientation as a part of a non-discrimination clause. That starts to get added at the local and state level across the country in various states in the 1990s. But then that's not enough. I mean, what happens as soon as, for example, the gay marriage opinion is handed down, what happens all of a sudden it's the attack on transphobia begins. And then all of a sudden we have this idea of gender identity. And isn't it interesting, the way that they got sexual orientation in was to say we're going to equate it with race. We're going to say it's genetic. You have no choice whatsoever over your sexual behavior. And then once they win that battle, they turn around and they say, oh, but gender can be fluid. It can switch from one day to the next based upon your choice. Really? So my, 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 sexual, my actual sex is chosen, but my sexual behavior is genetically programmed. Try and make sense out of this. It's absolutely incoherent. It's just this desperate idea that we, if we're going to win this thing, we have to expand the victim categories out there and convince more and more people that they are victims of what? White privilege. That's all you hear about on the college campuses is this idea of white privilege. And see, that's the, white privilege is the cultural counterpart of capitalism. Think about it. We need to overthrow the capitalist in the economic realm, and we need to defeat white privilege in the cultural realm. Now is it all starting to make sense? It really is. Well, that's just one of the ways that they go about a, a really – Uh, destroying the marketplace of ideas out there is by creating more victims and this supposed constitutional right to feel comfortable at all times. There's another way that they go about it, and it disturbs me very much because it's very costly. It is the, the idea of mandatory student activities, fees, and victim centers. These are two things that we have actually seen rapidly increase over the course of the last 25 years. You know, when I became a college professor, it was a very small amount that they actually paid every semester uh, for mandatory student activities fees. It was probably about $100. I'd have to actually have to go back and look that up, roughly $100. Now they pay $685 per semester in mandatory student activities fees. And so you naturally ask yourself the question, where does all the money go? What are they doing? It's really simple. We didn't have any victim centers in 1993. Then all of a sudden, we decided that we needed an Upperman African-American cultural center on our campus. We did that, 
And then that was followed eventually by El Centro Hispano. We then had a women's resource center. And then that was followed up by an LGBTQIA center. Ultimately, it all got to be too much to manage, and so we decided that we need an overarching office of diversity and inclusion. So we have five different government offices, each with their own budget and a set of administrators run by people who make six digits per year, just just sucking up your tax dollars left and right. And so you've got to ask yourself, what exactly is it that they do? I mean, you hear the story, well, we need a women's center. We need a a safe place for women. Really? UNCW needs a women's resource center. When they established it, it was 68% female. There you go. Okay? Um, So it's kind of interesting when you take a look at their activities. You, You begin to realize that it's really not actually about the students and simply having a physical place there to make them feel comfortable. It's actually really about the politics. And some of the stuff that they do, really, as you take a look at their expenditures, you first hear about them and you think, that's simply absurd. And then you think about it a little bit more, and it's actually a little bit more than absurd. It's actually very well planned out. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, I had this column that went viral. I had no idea that this column would go viral. It was my letter to Ed. It's it's now infamous, basically. And and Rush Limbaugh read it on the air, and, and Glenn Beck did, and Megyn Kelly interviewed me about it on Fox News. I just wrote. It was like my greatest hits of, of just campus lunacy and just really, really crazy professors on campuses. And so many of them were actually directors of these centers as well. And I remember one of the instances that I wrote about was this English professor, or um, excuse me, it was, act, it was actually a psychology professor at Western Carolina University. She was also directing the Women's Center, and she decided that she wanted to have a sexual empowerment week. And during sexual empowerment week, they were going to have a different theme every night. One of those was a bondage and s and seminar. And you think about that for a second. This is a college professor who teaches psychology who's teaching young people how to inflict pain upon one another for sexual pleasure. I mean, you talk about the inmates running the asylum. Let me repeat it. That actually is a psychology professor. Wow. It sounds to me like she probably needs a therapist. (laughs) She's teaching this seminar, and, and at first it just seems absurd. Let me give you another example. Our LGBTQIA office on our campus does all kinds of crazy stuff. But they have actually hosted, and forgive me as I say this, I'll just mention it once. I'm not trying to be crude. I'm not trying to be shocking. I'm just trying to tell you what's going on. They are showing films and hosting orgasm awareness seminars and masturbation seminars on college campus. With mandatory student activities fees, they do this. It's incredible. At the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill a few years ago, they had an orgasm awareness week. It's absolutely incredible. And at first, your reaction is, that's just ridiculous. And then you really think about what is behind all of the sexual politics. The radical sexual politics on the campus, I think, is just part of a larger scheme to transform the culture. What they really want to do is destroy the institution of marriage. They really do. And they want to take young people. And I talk about this, and and, you know, part of it, you, you know, we want to laugh, but I want to cry more than anything. Because you have these young, impressionable impressionable kids going off to campus at the age of 18, and it is as if they're being preyed upon by these cultural warriors. And they go out there, and they want these kids to be addicted to sex. They want to have these museums like they had on the display in the quad during that week at UNC Chapel Hill with sex toys from various decades. It was the history of this was actually put on display They're not ashamed of this at all. It is all out there in public and up front. And they are trying to sexualize our children because what they ultimately want to do is take a look at sex and marriage and procreation and split them from one another. Because if you want to have a big government and a Marxist society, you have to have weak families. And so I just take a look at this, and they're not just doing this for fun. They're not just doing this for giggles. I think this is a part of a long-term scheme. 
And it really bothers me, though, when in addition to doing all this highly sexualized programming, it really bothers me when they go out there and intentionally violate Southworth. There's a reason why I made this point. You notice in the first one, I combined speech codes with microaggression. In this one, I'm combining mandatory student activities fees with the victim centers. And let me explain the link. We developed that Women's Resource Center, or started it back in 2001. And it's interesting because the, just a year before that, the U.S. Supreme Court heard a very interesting case called Wisconsin versus Southworth in which a young conservative from the University of Wisconsin went all the way to the Supreme Court saying that he thought mandatory fees were actually unconstitutional. He said, why should I be forced to pay this fee and subsidize all of this speech when I don't agree with it? And he won that argument before the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, but then he actually had that part of it overturned in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. But there was a good part about the U.S. Supreme Court decision, which, by the way, happened to be nine to nothing. The case was argued by one of my attorneys, Jordan Lawrence, who argued my case in front of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. He got up there and he won something good. The condition was that the mandatory fees had to be redistributed on a viewpoint neutral basis. But you know what? This gets violated with regularity because the students do not know what their rights are. We have 12 different political groups on the campus at UNC Wilmington. And a couple of years ago, the Women's Resource Center was so brazen, they said we have an alliance with NARAL. They picked one of the 12 political groups, which was NARAL, the radical pro-abortion student group on our campus. They said we have an official liaison with them. The Women's Center actually advertised their events on the webpage. And they actually worked with them to get SGA funding to bring in events over and over, thousands of dollars apiece, always in favor of abortion. And they also took their regular budget and they used it to print, print flyers and things for NARAL, but only NARAL. Rosio Christie, a fine Christian group on our campus, found out about it. And they came along and said, hey, you know, Mike Adams is speaking. He's given a pro-life talk. Would you like to co-sponsor that? Guess what they said? No, they said, we only fund this group. That's just a direct violation of the Southworth case. Fortunately, I kept writing about it in my columns, and eventually we got a conservative Republican chancellor, Jose Zito Sartorelli, and as soon as he took his job, the leader of that Women's Resource Center lost her job because he reads... <laughs> Jose reads my columns... And he not only did that, but he actually demoted that center and said it's no longer going to be a university-wide center. We're going to cut the funding, and we're going to couch it within the College of Arts and Sciences. And all of that disproportionate sponsorship has ended. That's incredible. And that's a rare case where we had some good news. But actually, I'll add some more good news. There's another case 12 years ago. On this campus, a brave young student by the name of Stephanie Evans she was the head of the pro-life group on the campus, and eventually she went off to Campbell Law School and actually became a Blackstone Scholar for the Alliance Defending Freedom. She won one of those scholarships, one of those internships. I wrote a letter of recommendation for her, and I'll tell you why I did it. She found out that the Carolina Women's Center, which is located right here on Franklin Street, that they had had not one, not two, not three, not four, but five separate events on the abortion issue, and they were all in favor of abortion. And she read my columns as well. And she's like, hey, I know that they're violating my rights. And so she went and asked to have some pro-life speakers there. And you know how that went over. They said no. This young woman was so brave, she actually got on the phone and called the associate provost and said, I want to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the director of the Women's Center, me and you. And she directly confronted the head of that women's center and said, you've had all of this pro-choice or pro-abortion actually programming on the campus, and you refuse to represent the other side. As long as my mandatory student activities fees are supporting this center, you can't do that. And with a straight face, she just looked at Stephanie Evans and she says, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never had any event on the issue of abortion. Stephanie had secretly signed up under a private account for their email list, and she took a copy of all the advertisements for the pro-abortion events, and she handed them not to her but to the associate provost, who looked at the head of the Women's Center and says, if you ever lie to me again, I'll cut all of your funding. 
awesome. And said, in the future, if you ever have an event concerning ab abortion, you have to and make it a panel and invite Stephanie Evans and her group so that you can have, actually have an, a, a forum, a discussion representing both sides on a college campus. One of those rare victories, another victory that I talked about last night that was absolutely fantastic occurred at UNCG. I'll be brief because I told that story at length last night, but I actually went up and gave a speech there and was denied funding. My first speech on a college campus in February of 2004. While I was there, I found out that they had denied funding to the College Republican Group saying that they couldn't fund political groups on campus. No, that's a violation of viewpoint neutrality. If they pay the fees, they can get their money back. It doesn't matter whether they are political or not. That's exactly what the Supreme Court decision said. And they had denied them funding the night before they'd had a porn star on campus to give a lecture on safe sodomy for $3,000 in mandatory student activities funds from the Office of Student Life. I went in there and talked to those kids and asked them, how long have they been doing this to you? They said, well, there have been other occasions. We've tried to have a morals week. They had a gay pride week on campus. And this guy, I, I respect him so much, Travis Billingsley, went on to graduate and become a pastor. He's a fantastic young man. He said, you know, we tried to have a morals week to counteract the gay pride week. And I said, well, tell me something about the gay pride week. He told me all about it, and I just freaked out when he told me that they were having a gay prom on the campus of UNCG for high school students in the Greensboro area who felt uncomfortable going to the prom because it was heterosexist and heteronormative. They had a giant citywide prom on the campus of UNCG. I want you to think about that for a second. These college conservatives were paying mandatory fees and the university said, we won't give the money to you. They gave it to high school students who weren't actually enrolled on the campus. And that was absolutely illegal. Are you beginning to see the theme out there? Because this was an event, Gay Pride Week, that was co-sponsored with their LGBT office. So what happens then is we have this massive spread of all these victim centers on campus. And you wonder, how is it sustainable? They keep raising the mandatory activities fees and violating the constitutional rights of the students who are funding the system. That's the game. And it fits in with the entire theme of cultural Marxism because with every new center, you've got a brand new victim group. And ultimately, the victims will outnumber those white privileged folks who come from areas of economic privilege and will have a cultural revolution. The whole thing is it's it, as if it's out of a playbook. Yeah, it is out of a playbook. It, 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 it's called the brochure at the academic conference. They talk about these things. They know exactly what they're doing, and it is all very well planned. And so that's a second major issue that we absolutely have to learn to deal with. And I'm going to talk about it in just a minute. But the third issue on campus is one that is very serious in my mind because it is usually takes the form of very strong anti-religious bigotry. And that is the issue of these non-discrimination clauses. This has been a very serious issue on our campuses where we have these low-level administrators who will approach Cobbs and say, you know what you have to do? You have to sign this non-discrimination clause, which means that you're going to allow people in who actually don't share your beliefs. And this controversy in the state of North Carolina began right here at UNC Chapel Hill back in 1995. Now understand that this was before 911 when a gay activist by the name of Jonathan Curtis, who was an administrator at UNC Chapel Hill, wrote a letter to the Muslim Student Association in which he said, I am going to strip you of your official recognition on this campus if you don't change your constitution so that you allow practicing hom homosexuals to be members of your organization, voting members, and even leaders. You, you know how well that went over with the Muslims, okay? And there was this email exchange and a controversy broke out, and that was a rare time when we actually had a principled, a principled university attorney by the name of Susan Erringhouse. 
And she said there was this decision that came down, Rosenberger versus Rector, and this is before Southworth, but it did talk about the concept of viewpoint neutrality from the administration. And she says, I'm really worried that you're violating this decision of Rosenberger versus Rector. So she, she actually sent an email to Curtis and said, leave the Muslims alone, cease and desist. Seven years went by. This is how committed these people are. He keeps this low-paying government job for seven years, handling the constitutions of the student groups, all 479 of them at that time, at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I know because I researched this very carefully in preparation for a lawsuit, but I get ahead of myself. He sat there for seven years, and then all of a sudden he got good news. The law school got a new dean by the name of Gene Nickel. And he took that job, and as a part of the deal, you see, Susan Erringhouse was leaving, and the wife of Gene Nickel, Glenn George, actually got to become the university counsel. There was an announcement in late November of 2002 on a Friday afternoon that she would become the new university counsel. Over the weekend, Curtis went home and wrote, two dozen letters to religious organizations on the campus saying, you know what, I'm bothered by certain things in your constitution. He wrote one to a Christian group saying, you know what, you're discriminatory. You said that this is a group for people who believe in God. That discriminates. Why should you have to believe in God to be a member of a Christian organization? It's incredible. Well, the pattern became pretty obvious, and the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education found out about it and did a press release on New Year's Day 2003. I heard about this, and I was so angry by it that I actually called George on the phone. I actually sent her an email. I'm sorry. And I said, I'm submitting to you a public records request. I want every single email that Jonathan Curtis has sent to any organization on campus for the last decade. She called me and said, please don't do that. That's going to be a lot of work. I said, don't you ever call me again. My attorney is Charlton Allen, who is the founder of the Carolina Review. All future communication will be with him. She knew a lawsuit was brewing, but it was so difficult because I got all 1,250 emails, and I found a pattern of discrimination. What was sad about it was I had to get on the phone. I had to get on the email. It took me 18 months to get a plaintiff. I'm calling all these Christian organizations and telling them, you know, what they're doing to you is unconstitutional. I've got free attorneys. It won't cost you anything. You can restore freedom of association and religious freedom on this campus and get this bigot off of your back. You understand that the tactic that Curtis was doing was barred from the Klan. The Klan in the 50s used to try and join the NAACP and say, you know what? We're going to try and change your belief structure, and if you won't let us in, we're going to rip your tax-exempt status away from you. How do you like that? In the name of tolerance and inclusion, the LGBT activist says, we're going to copy the Klan. Let that sink in for a minute. But it disappointed me so much that it took a year and a half, and all of a sudden, a phone call finally got answered by a young kid by the name of Tremaine Manson. And he was with a group called Alpha Iota Omega. You want to talk about the perfect plaintiffs. They were a Christian organization. There was like seven of them. No white people. <laughs> they were black and Asian. I said, oh, this is beautiful. You won't succumb to his demands and sign the non-discrimination clause, and then he'll throw the minorities off campus in the name of inclusion and diversity. I said, oh, this is fantastic. And they agreed to be plaintiffs, and the ADF represented them starting in 2004. And then in 2005, there was an injunction from a federal court in Greensboro. We won the case. It was awesome. And what was fascinating about that was six months later, the fire did their study of the speech codes, but they also did a study. There are 17 campuses in the UNC system now. There were 16 back then. They did a study of all the group membership policies, and isn't it incredible? 13 of the 16 campuses in the UNC system had the exact same policy that Curtis was trying to enforce unconstitutionally. And so there's just a really simple question that I've got for you. What does the university council do at the University of North Carolina? 
in the entire system, in the general administration, this army of lawyers that they've got. You would think after you lost a federal case and lost an injunction on an issue, you would go look around and see if any of the other campuses were doing the same thing. But no, they didn't do anything. So I thought it'd just be a matter of time. I had no idea that it wouldn't happen until 2012, that we'd have an opportunity to do something about it. Rocio Christie, brave Christian apologetic organization, starts at UNC Wilmington. They called me up and they asked, would you be our faculty advisor? Good move. Really good move. Because they went into a little room after they wrote their constitution saying that this is a club for people who subscribe to orthodox Christian belief. They were, they were told by some lower-level administrator. I can't remember the titles of all these people. It's probably like the, the assistant to the associate dean for noise complaints and parking tickets or something. <laughs> but they're called into this dark little room, and they're told, we don't like your constitution. It says that you have to subscribe to Orthodox Christian belief to be a member of Rosho Christi. Take it out. They got on the phone, and they called me. We all know what happened next. I didn't call. I sent an email to create a paper trail, and I sent an email to that assistant to the associate vice provost for noise complaints and diversity and parking tickets or whatever in Greek life. But I sent the email, and I said, you are violating the free association rights of my Christian organization, and you will cease and desist. You will. There's no question. You will. I was ticked. They wrote back and said, your inquiry is inappropriate at this time. <laughs> Big mistake. I got on the phone and called Robert Shibley in Apex, the vice president of the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. I said, I need your help working on a public records request. We got copies of all the constitutions and all of the correspondence requested. We were doing the same thing at UNCW. And it's interesting because I sent that registered letter. Nothing says you're about to get sued like a registered letter. I sent it on a Friday. They received it on a Monday. And in 48 hours, they convened an emergency meeting and they changed the policy to adopt the policy at Chapel Hill that they had to adopt after losing the suit. We won. At that time, I'm working on a right to counsel bill called the SAE Act, basically. First one passed in America, and I'm working together with a bunch of people. One of them is Tom Goolsby, who was a senator and who was head of the J-1 committee. And then all this happened while we were working on that issue. And I went and I got the perfect religious liberty bill in this country. It was fantastic. The state of Ohio had passed one that said that at all junior colleges and all universities, the administration has no right to tell kids who's in the club and who isn't, no right to say who votes and who doesn't, no right to say uh, who is a leader or not, and no authority to interfere with their internal disciplinary matters. That's the best possible policy. It said the students control their organizations completely, but out. And that was awesome. Robert showed it to me. I printed it out, and I walked into a coffee shop, and I sat down with Tom Goolsby, and I gave it to him. I said, make this law. Find a sponsor. They did. It got buried somewhere in committee somewhere the next year. It just got lost. And I was going through my lawsuit with UNC Wilmington and going through negotiations. And I had to kind of depart from the issue for a little while. Then I went back and, and we won. Obviously, my verdict was uh, March 20th of 2014. And I was up here doing Neil Cavuto or something. I had to get up and go on camera at Space Link or something in Raleigh. And it had to beam me up and all that. And I had a meeting with uh, Jenna Ashley Robinson, who is the, the head of the Pope Center for Higher Education Policy. They've now changed their name, what, to the Watson Center, I believe. Uh, uh, James, James Watson uh, Center for Academic Martin. Renewal. James Martin, I'm sorry, for Academic Renewal. And she sat down and said, what would you like to see happen? What an amazing woman she is. I said, now that my verdict is over, we have to get the religious liberty bill. We have to have this thing passed here. We gotta do we gotta do this. She says, Oh, we're working on that. She was already working on that together with the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education and the NC Family Policy Council. They pushed that thing through, and it was signed by Governor McCrory in July. And that is awesome. 
I wanted to leave you with that positive note because I've just said out there that there are three things that are serious threats to free speech on our college campuses that are helping them spread cultural Marxism on the campus. And they're very serious. You notice that we have only dealt with one of the problems and we have done it legislatively. And so what does that mean that we need to do next? The next thing we need to do is attack the next most serious issue, which is the issue of campus speech codes and microaggression. Good news. The bill has already be, been written by Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest's office. I gave a speech in April. Actually, it was the same day that I met with uh, Jenna, or the day after that, at a church here in Raleigh. I called out Dan Forrest in the crowd, and I said, we need leadership from our politicians to do something about the free speech problem on our campuses. And he looked at me, and he nodded, and he says, we do, and I will. Guess what? I got a phone call from him at 9.30 in the morning, the day after his reelection, and he says, we're going for it. We're pushing this thing through, and we need your help. It's been written. I've brought my friends from the ADF in. We've worked on it. we got a sponsor. We're going to move this thing through. And I will tell you what's going to happen. It is going to go through. The representatives are going to vote this up. And then Roy Cooper is going to veto it. I can absolutely guarantee you, because we have the most anti-free speech governor that we have ever had. This is the same guy who fought me in court for seven years. It was Cooper who was my opposition in the lawsuit, who tried to deny my promotion. He was the one who was fighting behind NC State when they were requiring that permitting uh, process at NC State simply to share the gospel. He sent the same two feminist lawyers he sent into my trial into court to defend that unconstitutional policy, and he lost. And so here are the action items. We need to prepare right now for that veto. It's coming. The legislation will go through and it will be vetoed, and we need to fight in the court of public opinion. You need to contact all of your representatives. You need to write letters to the editor. You need to write to every – you need to call into every radio station, including NPR, here in the state of North Carolina, and I am dead serious. You need to get as serious about this issue as the opposition is and give them a major black eye in the court of public opinion and tell your representatives that this is the most serious issue that we're facing in our country. No other issue matters once free speech is gone. The republic is lost. And then the next action item, and I will conclude. As soon as we get this bill through, we need to get to work on the next one. And the next legislative bill will ban mandatory student activities fees in the entire state of North Carolina. We're not going to pay a free speech tax to have it pilfered by criminals working in the dean's office. And we're going to say that every women's center, every single racially divisive Af African-American center, El Centro Hispano, LGBTQIA office, they can open their doors and keep their doors open as long as they get funding from external sources through grant money, through doing legitimate academic resource, uh, research. And if they can't get the grants, they need to be shut down immediately. <laughs> Perpetual victimhood is unsustainable, ladies and gentlemen, economically and as a culture. Don't let anyone lie to you and say that the legislature is the enemy of academic freedom, that the legislature is the enemy of free speech. In 1963, it is true that our legislature passed a speaker ban against known communists and people who had refused to answer the question as to whether or not they were communists. And it's true that in the past, the legislature has egregiously violated the First Amendment. But that only happened when the Democrats were in charge. Now the Republicans are in charge, and now the legislature is the friend of freedom of expression. 
We proved that in the religious liberty bill. We are going to prove it again in a free speech bill and then again in a bill dealing with the issue of mandatory student activities fees. But we can only do it with your help. Ladies and gentlemen, this is war. And you need to ask yourselves, are you ready to fight? You know I am. Because I've got a, a philosophy that can be summarized in two words. Giddy up, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Let's get it on. Thank you, and God bless you all. How are you? Thank you for being here. Thank you, too. Uh, yes. I don't know. Uh, what are your thoughts on the new chancellor at UNC? Will she be a, a positive, or will she let the status quo? Uh, yeah, I can actually repeat the question. The question is concerning spellings, uh, basically. And um, I am not impressed at all. Uh, with spellings, uh, I, I got the sense uh, when she when she came here that it, it wasn't going to be good. I, I, I just you're not a real conservative if you care what liberals think about you. One of the things that we need to have in a new free speech bill, which I happen to have seen it, and it just might be in there is a statement of institutional neutrality at every single institution of higher learning in this, in this state, which says that it is not our purpose as a university to take stands on political issues, but to get out of the way and allow the First Amendment to do its work. She has uh, expressed her anti-HB2 and her anti-Trump uh, views out there. And Now, by the way, uh, I didn't like Trump at all. But I have the capacity to admit when I was wrong. And I'm looking and I am impressed with this guy so far. And I just want to say <laughs> to Spellings, the election is over. Get over it and get back to running the university from a neutral position. <laughs> On the other hand, Sartorelli is doing a fantastic job. The very best chancellor we have in the entire UNC system is my boss, uh, Jose Sartorelli. And so the solution is get rid of spellings and get him up there. That's just my opinion. <laughs> Fire away, unless you're armed. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> you had, uh, I, the day after I took a job at a community college, uh, I was offered the opportunity to go to the safe zone training. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this. A junior college? Say again? Was it at a junior college? It was at a community college. Community college. So mm -hmm. a, yeah. a UNC employee self-identified as a transgender male in a lesbian relationship named that was how she how how z yeah. described itself yeah and uh it talked all about gender and heterosexism the whole marxist little breakout groups and how your school right is uh heterosexist second day on the job you know and so okay. right right the bottom line is they're exporting this these she works here in chapel hill mm -hmm, right. and goes across to the community colleges they're not happy brainwashing freshmen because these juniors that come in from the community colleges are not as, they're not as, they're, this, this brainwashing. Do you know the name of this them. individual? Say again? Do you know the name of the individual? Who's Terry the Phoenix. Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I was um, in New York City uh, about Terry. seven years ago, and uh, I was doing an interview with World Magazine, and it was Marvin Alasky, and he shared the story of when he was at the University of Texas, all of a sudden, uh, a faculty member got up and, and said, um, I just want you guys to know that I'm a female on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but I'm a male on, uh, on, Tuesdays, and, uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And, uh, of course, it, it raised the obvious question, what do you do on Sunday? Is that a day of rest on Sunday? <laughs> what exactly is done here? But it really is incredible, uh, you know, the, the extent to which this ideology is, is getting out of, out of control. And it bothers me that it's one thing to have the lunatic in the classroom who's just, you know, and, and extremist from time to time actually can quite possibly make good, good professors, but they can't ever make good administrators. And what really bothers me is that we have these expanding administrative positions, and so many of them take the form of, you notice how we used to have like a provost or a dean, and now you've got the associate and the assistant, and, and then the assistant to the associate, and it's multiplied substantially. I just want to give you a figure right now. Uh, back in 1993, the chancellor of UNC Wilmington, uh, James Lutze, made $98,000 a year. 
15 years later, we had 153 administrators on the campus who made over $100,000 a year. And ultimately, we've got to ask the question, how is it happening that we're getting all these administrators? Like, for example, a person who would typically do that sort of training would be a full-time administrator, usually, uh, in an office of diversity inclusion, uh, and inclusion or in an LGBTQIA office. And I just want to throw it out there. The reason why this is happening, it's the increasing encroachment by the federal government on our state institutions of higher learning. When we made it very easy to get federal student loans, everyone started going to college. And it interrupted the natural supply and demand, the, the natural economic Flavor. relationship. So what happened then is they suddenly realized that they could begin to raise tuition and people would still pay it because now people aren't saving for college anymore. They're not piling a field for their son to go to college. They're going to the government. And we've got to really think about this because this is the issue, okay? You think about it, when they know that people will keep coming after the product because they've got the loan, they are going to raise tuition. Tuition was raised, I think, from the late 80s. Uh, the next 25 years, I think tuition went up on average in this country by about 400% way beyond inflation. And what did they do with all the money? They hired more administrators. And so ultimately, a lot of the correction of this can actually be done by having the right head of the Department of Education, which I actually don't think we've got right now. That's Trump's one mistake. I won't go into the, re the reasons for that. I don't think she's good. But ultimately, Republicans have to get aggressive and ask themselves the simple question, why do we have a federal Department of Education in the first place? <laughs> if you're tired of Title IX, you have to realize someone has to enforce it, and it's always a bureaucrat. What can we do now to, to push back against this encroachment, this hegemony? Well, that has to become a platform in the GOP. Uh, that has become a plank in the GOP platform again. That's what has to happen. And I think we actually, I can't believe I'm saying this, uh, but I think that if we actually move forward with that, I think we have a president who would actually agree to eliminate that department. And we need to, we need to swing for the fences. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Fred McCoy from Chapel Hill. You've made a fantastic case for how it is that people are trying to murder our culture. Yeah. Apathy is equally on my mind, Yes, which is cultural suicide. Mm -hmm. What would you say about our willingness to blithely go along mm -hmm. with these murderers? Yeah. Uh, just, you know, I'm going to throw something at you that you're not expecting right now because we're talking about a, a lot of political things right now. Do you know what really bothers me? It's our churches. That's what's on my mind a lot, is that Christianity, we still are a, a culture that has a worldview that is a Judeo-Christian worldview. It is. I mean, that's just the basic worldview. I teach at Summit Ministries every summer, and we basically teach young people that there are six different worldviews out there competing for global domination. And we explain why we think Christianity is true, basically, and, and we also expose what we think are the weaknesses of um, the other worldviews. It bothers me. You know, Christianity is a religion where Christians are supposed to influence the culture. That's what they're supposed to do. That's what the Great Commission is. It, it, don't, don't, don't go and recruit small group members. It says recruit disciples. And it bothers me that so many Christians in our culture, and the church basically, is catering to the culture that the culture is actually influencing the church. And the larger consequence of that is that from the pulpit, we're getting feel-good messages, and we're not getting worldview. And I think a lot of the apathy that we're seeing in our society comes from a lack of discernment concerning worldview. Important questions about what is human nature, for example. Are we good or are we fallen? I've got news for you. You might think that's a religious question, but that translates into politics because the difference between a conservative and a liberal, if you get down to one thing, the liberal thinks people are good and the conservative knows people are bad. 
and that translates into all of our economic policy, all of our correctional policy, and all of our foreign policy. And so it is a deep, deep, deep thing. And I would just ask people, basically, uh, be careful what you subsidize out there. And ask yourself the question, are you going to a church that subsidizes political apathy? Do you actually have a pastor who thinks that Jesus wasn't involved in politics? Yes, he was. The Pharisees were the politicians. He was in their face. Read Matthew 23. Okay? I'm serious. We need to make sure that we're not subsidizing that apathy. And another thing, understand that when it comes to firing people up, that the little things count. I always come and talk about the big things, about the larger vision, but the little things count as well. You know, for example, I hear people say no one was ever influenced by a Facebook argument. I was in a restaurant the other day, and a man comes walking up to me, and he says, you don't know me at all. But he goes, I just want you to know. I'm, I follow you. on. We're not even friends on Facebook, but I follow you on Facebook. And I've been pro-life all of my life, but your constant post on the abortion issue have bothered me so badly that my wife and I have now joined the March for Life, and we've now gotten on the board of the local crisis pregnancy center. Okay, that's one couple right there that's making a difference. I actually had a student, a former student from NC State, tell me one time that he became pro-life because of a column that was written, and he did not abort his child when he found out that his child had Down syndrome. He read a column, and he tearfully thanked me for writing that. Get a website. Get a blog. Write a letter to the editor. A well-crafted letter to the editor can have more influence on the culture than a journal article written by a college professor that's read by 12 people. <laughs> I'm serious. And you have to understand that we're dealing with, when we're dealing with the left, why are they apathetic? Often, they don't have children. They don't have a church. They have time on their hands. And secular humanism is not just their worldview, it's their religion. It's their church. And man, we've got to find the time, not only to bring worldview back into our churches and get our churches politically involved, but also do the little things as well. Sorry if that turned into a sermon. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> this is interesting. All of my questions are coming from the left, but, <laughs> but yet from the right. Thank you. Okay. If, uh, you, if we write letters to our congressmen like yeah. you've asked yes. us to do, yes. what bill number should we reference? Uh, oh, our, our representatives, um, that's yeah. not known yet. Oh, okay. Okay, but um, it's, it's actually not important that you have a bill number on it. They know what the number is. Okay. So, for example, when we were trying to push through the, uh, the Student Right to Counsel Act, that was not hard. By the way, do you know the vote was 112 to 1 when we did that? that he wasn't there. <laughs> he was a Democrat. He wasn't a horror. But it, I'm, no, I'm, I'm not being funny this time. For I mean, I actually really, I'm, I'm serious. No one actually really opposed it because there's some things everyone can agree on, which is you shouldn't throw kids out of colleges at hearings when they're facing the university attorney and they don't have their own and they're a teenager. Uh, so what's interesting is if you were supporting a bill like that, you could simply send them a letter saying it's just an issue of fundamental fairness that college students have at least the option of having counsel. A short, short letter does it. Okay. And it's also important to get friends as well. Uh, there was a time in 2005, I think, where a speech code was actually defeated at Dartmouth, uh, where a student who was mad about it uh, contacted one of the alums who was a multimillionaire. Multimillionaires, by the way, hang out with other millionaires. And he wrote a letter and actually Xeroxed it and said, here's what my letter to Dartmouth says. I won't give any more contributions at all to the school unless you get rid of that speech code. Okay. And the school actually found out that the speech code was going to cost them like tens of millions of dollars a year. And they thought, oh, we won't do that anymore. Okay. So what you've got to do whenever you write a letter is try and identify influential friends that you have to send them in mass. And that's a very important thing, letter writing. Sometimes they just don't know what's going on and they don't really know what's important to the people. 
And the good news that we have on this issue right now is because of recent incidents that have occurred, it's on the mind of the average person now. It's no longer an escapable issue. When Mizu happens, when Yale happens, when Middlebury happens, that, that hits the front page everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I'm glad that you mentioned Middlebury because I wanted to ask, um, after the um, a riot and the attacks on, on Murray at, at Middlebury, the administration put out what looks like a pretty good series of statements about right. uh, their policies. And um, uh, my question has to do with what your um, uh, sense is of the effectiveness of an administrative statement versus uh, what sort of actions they might uh, um, take um, to enforce um, uh, the ability of people to speak on campus when they're um, uh, controversial. This is incredibly good news. Uh, you know, all I can say is whenever you hear a college administrator say something positive about free speech, it's so rare, it's refreshing. And it's always extremely good news. They're realizing something I've known. I've been doing this for, you know, I've been a First Amendment activist now for 15 years. And one of the things I've said is they're coming after you eventually. Guess what? Now they are. At, at some point, we use the term snowflake all the time when we talk about like microaggression. What we don't realize is, and sure, you know, I talked about last night how it's, it's reverse Darwinism. If you say that the emotionally weakest person in an argument wins because he's offended, and then the, the strong person has to shut up, that's like survival of the least emotionally fit person in the conversation. It's like reverse Darwinism. And so that really is the concept of the snowflake. But we need to understand something else is going on as well. When we teach this stuff, we also produce narcissism. It's not just a lack of emotional strength that is rewarded, but it's also a lack of humility. If we teach young people, my emotions trump your ideas. My feelings are more important than your thoughts. What kind of a message have we sent to people? Eventually, it's going to get out of control. There's going to be riots. They're going to be acting like two-year-olds when they don't get their way. And look at Mizzou. Look at Mizzou. That whole situation with Black Lives Matter got out of control. And they demand the head of the chancellor, the president of that school. Guess what? He's a liberal. Loses his job. They're eating their own. Okay? They're eating their own. And so they're going to wake up and figure it out. Some of them. But most aren't. The reason why you're talking about that letter is because it's an anomaly. Yes. And because she, she brought it up because she was surprised when she saw it. Ergo, the majority are not going to arrive at that obvious conclusion themselves. And that's why we need the leadership of people like Dan Forrest uh, and Bills. We need to teach the professors what they can't figure out on their own. Thank you. You've given us some good charges, and you've spoken a lot about the threats to free speech on yes. college campuses. Yes. On college campuses, there's also a problem with um, there's a threat to uh, the constitutional right to due process. Yes, yes. And I wondered how you feel about some of the overreaches of the um, involving Title IX. Yes. And the Department of Education, the Office of Civil it, Rights. It's all, yeah, absolutely all from the Department of Education. Uh, no question about it. And it's really been amazing. Um, I just actually wrote uh, an article with the former vice president of FIRE, Adam Kissel, uh, we, on the history of uh, free speech problems in the University of North Carolina system. I actually go through the entire argument that the threats don't come from the right, they come from the left. And they don't come from outside the school, they come from within the system. And the next project that we get to work on this summer is actually going to be on a history of the right to counsel in higher education. And it's going to focus largely upon the SAE Act and what has happened since then. That's the overlooked thing. And it's interesting, as I try and get the SAE Act passed in other states, we have, by the way, and there are also similar acts. That's the beginning of due process, by the way. That's actually most of due process, having an attorney, <laughs> really. Like the other violations don't matter as much when you have an attorney. It's extremely important. But that's kind of a long-term vision that we've got. And I just want to be totally honest with you. 
is if Trump were to put someone in the Department of Education who really gets it immediately, um, like me, I should be the head of the Department of Education. I've never thought of that until... Because it would be such a short tenure. I would go in there and like take the dear colleague letter with all these demands. What we've seen is extortion. Uh, you know, and, and it's really interesting. We, we all think that the biggest problem in politics is bribery. No, it's extortion. Everyone thinks it's sources of bribery coming from outside Washington. No, it's not. It's extortion coming from Washington. They write bills all the time, and then they sit down with businesses, and they say, do you want to see this passed? Of course you don't. That's extortion. That is exactly... <laughs> He doesn't know where he is. <laughs> My goodness. No, but really, that is exactly what the Department of Education has been doing. You understand that all those things about how women, when they accuse someone of sexual assault on a college campus, when the, the guy is exonerated, they get to keep having the trial over and over again. You get double and triple jeopardy. And in addition to that, they also had um, you know, the requirement that Proof beyond a reasonable doubt, that standard be lowered to preponderance of evidence, which is actually the civil standard instead of the criminal standard, which there's a more fundamental question as to why are we having criminal trials on college campuses in the first place. Okay, they're tribunals. Okay, but all of that, those changes came from extortion threats from the Department of Education saying we're going to withdraw your grant funding for research. So ultimately, you ask yourself the question, why does the college professor not care about due process? He cares more about having a grant that allows him to not teach very often and to have a lifestyle. Most professors don't like students. Most professors don't like to teach. And their getting positioned where they want to be requires getting a hold of that money. So ultimately, a Department of Education, a head of the Department of Edu Education, has got to come in and reverse some of those mandates and immediately start the process for eliminating the department altogether. It goes back to that. Right. So hopefully Trump will rescind, hopefully Trump will rescind the uh, Dear Colleague letter of 2011. We'll see. But are you, are you also getting involved in lawsuits uh, uh, with fire or otherwise on, on that issue? Uh, I, 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 I will not be – my role is changing now, uh, basically. Um, you just ask a really big question, um, but I, I was a community disorganizer for a long time. <laughs> and there's an acorn of truth in that, by the way. <laughs> anyway. My poor students, it just never ends, the puns, okay? Uh, but I, I did a lot of that. To be honest with you, when I started getting involved in that, we didn't have, have all these legal organizations out there. And the ADF has grown so much in their Center for Academic Freedom and all that. And I kind of realized after my lawsuit was over, before it was over actually, what I need to do is to get involved in legislation. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was in the conversation the first conversation that began the SAE Act and that movement, and then got involved, obviously, with Tom and trying to get the religious freedom thing. I've been working with Dan on the free speech bill, and I'm dead serious about that other bill concerning mandatory student activities fees. That's going to be my role. As long as we've got this good legislature, and as long as I've got one of my former students, John Bell, who is now the House Majority Leader, and as long as I can threaten him and tell stories about what he did in college and tell him that I can still go back and change his grades and revoke his degree. He's a little slow, and he falls for that one. But as long as I can keep those connections going and continue to feed and actually work on, work on writing some legislation, that is all I'm going to do. That's, that's where I am right now. Yeah. So there you go. What does SAA stand for? Uh, oh, the, the, the student. This is so fantastic. Uh, it's the Student Administrative Equity Act. It occurred when they threw SAE off campus, the, the group SAE, okay? That's actually the fraternity. Now, this is wonderful. This is magical. They started to question them about alcohol-related violations. 
and they refused to give them an, an attorney. And then they got thrown off, and one of their founders called me on the phone. And he said their constitutional rights were violated, right? I said, no, the Sixth Amendment right to counsel is in every cause, and the Sixth Amendment only applies to criminal proceedings. This was civil in nature. He said, so what is the solution? I said, the solution is a new bill. It was born. Now it exists in four states, the exact same bill right now. It was born in that conversation. And we sat there, and I cannot take credit for this. It was SAE. Um, it was a gentleman. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention his name, um, but he sat down. And he was one of the founders of SAE. He goes, wouldn't it be funny if we got an SAE John Bell to be the sponsor of it and called it the Student Administrative Equity Act, but don't use the acronym until it passes. And then it became law as the SAE Act. So it was their ultimate revenge to let the whole world know, you threw us off campus. We not only got back on campus, but we changed the law and started a trend across the country in our own name. That's a rambunctious bunch of frat boys. How many more are over here with questions? I know there's some people standing. How many more questions? Just one. Cool. Yeah. Okay, great. We've got time for the last one. Over here. Um, I'm just interested in the attitude of professors, liberal and conservative, from this context. When you have students that say there is no objection, uh, objective truth as far as male and female, right. then it seems like to me, if, if we can't say that's objective truth, then something subjective like grades, are you seeing students coming and threatening professors because they got a C when their reality says they got an A? And are liberal professors starting to fear that that type of mentality is seeping in? I wonder if you guys are talking with each other I, about that. No, I don't think that um, – no, not at all. I mean, I, I think the leftist professors on the campus have, have uh, um, a very short um, moral time clock, basically. You know, uh, many of them are, are really more concerned with winning the immediate battle. And if there's a contradiction, they'll deal with that later. Okay, and they might have a larger plan, but they tend to be, get consumed and sometimes not really think about the consequences until they're upon them. Now, what evidence do I have for that? The speech code issue. Okay, they should have known in advance that it was going to produce that kind of culture, but they weren't figuring it out very quickly. Uh, there are some incredible contradictions, aren't there? But I, what, one thing that I wish is that more cons uh, conservative professors would actually try and question that in, in the class and just ask difficult – when you have an absurd view of something, the best way to deal with it is simply to ask questions. Are you when you're dealing with someone who has an absurd view? And I wish more conservative professors would actually talk about the implications of the view in the class and ask people, if you believe that you are female, does it mean you're female? Okay? If you believe that you are black, does it mean that you're black? If you believe, if someone comes up and says they're five foot two, but says that they're six foot five, do you have to respect that? And just continue to ask the questions in the classroom and let them walk through the absurdity of the entire thing. But you notice something very interesting will happen is that they will only apply relativism to sex. If you ask them a question like, you know, does a person get to decide whether they're male or female, they will say, oh, absolutely. But then you ask the question of whether they can demand that the DMV say that they're six foot five when they're only five foot two. They're more likely to say that's absurd. Because remember that they're only willing to live in this universe where they suspend all reason if it's in the interest of what? Advancing sexual politics. That's where they lose all reason. Some Supreme Court justices have done a very good job. Kennedy, through all his disappointments, Justice Kennedy, Kennedy has actually pointed out in a couple of cases, uh, abortion cases, that it seems like the justices on the Supreme Court who always rule in favor of abortion, that they simply lose the ability to reason on that subject and that subject alone. Well, we have to think about why, because ultimately what's at stake? Sexual liberty. Whenever sex is involved, people will become very irrational. And so you need to begin to ask those. I, I wish more professors would talk about it, but quite frankly, they're afraid to. Good stuff. Another question. Are you aware or would you hear a comment about the, as I understand it, growing business and other things that are happening in small and medium business hiring managers? 
when they were going against academic credentials and against academia and actually valuing individuals with less education and more practical training, yeah. like Marine Corps graduates, yeah. rather than Ivy League graduates, mm -hmm. for their hiring decisions. Is this a market trend that you think is going to affect? Uh, yeah, um, the gentleman asked a question about whether um, I've heard that small businesses and medium-sized businesses, as opposed to larger corporations, uh, are beginning to take a different view about credentials and hiring that focuses less on formal education and more on life experiences outside of the context of higher education. Um, I haven't heard much about that, but I'm not surprised. You would be very intelligent if you're a small business owner uh, or a medium-sized business owner uh, to begin to ask yourself some serious questions about people getting college degrees these days. I mean, it used to be the case that it simply would demonstrate that the person either had some expertise in a given area or that they had set a goal and they'd stuck with it and it just said something about their character. Not anymore. Anyone can get a loan to go to college, and with great inflation, anyone can get out of college. And so the degree doesn't mean what it means anymore, and now it carries more baggage with them. Because now there's a substantial likelihood that if they went to a secular university, that they had a shift in their worldview that's not healthy. They begin to question objective truth, and that actually creates problems in the workplace, obviously not just for ethics, but also for problem solving. So they would be very intelligent uh, to look at a more truly diverse set of characteristics. If that's happening, I'm glad to hear it. Not to say that they would discount education and not consider it, but to have a more complex formula makes sense. As a manager, I didn't hire. I went strictly to state school. Good for you. And Interesting, interesting. We're seeing the trend. And I participated in it. And there was a good. Good. Yes, sir. Yes. Absolutely. Um, the gentleman has just raised a point that's so important. We worry about secular universities, but this has spilled over into religious uh, universities as well. You know what? And the Catholic universities in some instances have been absolutely the most shocking. Uh, Marquette is an example. I wrote a column 13 years ago called McCarthyism at Marquette. And it was a pun, of course, because the dean of students was named McCarthy. I'm not, you can't make this up. He banned the Catholic students on campus from having a support the troops rally because he said that that was in opposition to Catholic values. Guess what? They had an LGBT rally and a pro-choice rally. So homosexuality and abortion are Catholic values, but not war under any circumstances whatsoever. Thank you for bringing that up. And the McAdams case there on that campus recently in his treatment in recent years shows you're absolutely correct. We haven't even gotten to DePaul it's, and Gonzaga. It's all across the country. Thank you.